guests each week, bringing you the best relationship advice. All right. Welcome to Oxygen 365. I'm your host, Noel Metter, and this is episode number 21. Today's guest is Steve Emmons. Steve is the international master trainer for Gordon Training. He has taught parent effectiveness training courses in the U.S. and internationally for over 40 years and has trained thousands of professionals in over two dozen countries to become parent effectiveness instructors. Today, uh, we're going to be learning useful parent-to-child communication skills from the parenting effectiveness training, which was pioneered by the late Dr. Thomas Gordon. Steve, it's great to have you on the show. My pleasure. Glad to be here. You know, I think uh, this is a topic that is one that our audience is constantly looking for help, advice on this whole idea of how do I become the right parent and uh, especially when it comes to my kids. I mean, it's not something where you generally have a handbook handed to you when you start having kids. And yet there's so many issues that come up. And I know for you, you've been doing this for 40 years. So I'm, I'm excited to ask some of the questions around uh, the communication skills. And I think that's where you guys are kind of uniquely positioned in helping parents in terms of how they're communicating with their child. But maybe we start with some of the legacy of what this program's all about. Going back to um, Dr. Thomas. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, in, in 2012, PET celebrated its 50th anniversary. Wow. Um, so it's been around. It, it Really, PET is, is one of the grandparents or the grandparent of parenting programs. Hmm. Uh, Harvard University several years ago did a study, and they found out in, currently now there are more than 50,000 different kinds of parent programs in the U.S., not wow. just courses, but different programs. And yet PET really is the, is the grandparent for much of that. So it, it goes back... Um, that, that's a double-edged sword. I do a lot of work now. We've been introducing the program in China, of all places. Wow. Being very well recepted. And there, 50 years, they say, wow, that's wonderful. It's been around so long. <laughs> Sometimes in the States, parents say, oh, it's been around so long. What's something new? We want the newest thing. <laughs> but, but in fact, PET has, has weathered the years, and it's just as relevant today as it was 50 years ago. So tell me about the pet philosophy. I think that's pretty, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you have used that acronym, but tell us about the philosophy behind it. Well, t it all started with Tom Gordon, who moved out to California, was a, was a, a therapist, a counselor, and a lot of the parents he was dealing with said, we're not the problem, uh, it's our kids, can you fix our kids? And he'd meet with some of their kids, and they'd say, no, it's our parents the problem. What he realized was that a lot of the society and the experts were blaming parents for all the problems of society or their kids, but nobody was really helping them. And yet there were skills out there, how to listen better and things that were being taught to professionals. So Tom really started with that and said he wanted to focus on helping parents, uh, giving them some skills like how to listen better, how to solve problems and deal with conflicts in a much better way. So that's where it started. And the focus of PET very much is on, on non-use of power in order to build a relationship with your kids. Hmm. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, parents uh, up until PET, basically they had two options. And, and coming from, you know, in the past, one was to use power, to be authoritarian, to the parents in charge and, and mm -hmm. gives their solution to the kids and uses rewards and punishments. Most of us or many of us grew up with that in the kind of in the quote unquote old days. The other option for many parents was permissive. Let your kids get what they want. Give them everything. We see that a lot today, for instance. Mm -hmm. And both of those carry some big risks. Yeah. So PET really says it's a, there's a third option. Uh, parents can get their needs met. They can be clear about what behaviors are not okay with them. They can help uh, their children develop into strong, self-sufficient, responsible adults. And yet also kids can get their needs expressed and they can be involved in, in solving problems, making decisions, not just being told what to do. Yeah. So at the heart of this third option, the pet philosophy, what is that? I mean, what, what well, makes Tom it so unique? It the, Tom, Tom called it the no-lose problem-solving method. Okay. And that in, instead of the parents winning and the children losing or the children winning permissive and the parents losing, that there's a way to really identify what, what the needs are of the parents and the children before you come up with solutions. I mean, most, most problems and conflicts are really fights over solutions. The parent says bedtime is 8 o'clock and the right. child says no, 9 o'clock, <laughs> and they fight over solutions. And yet if you get at the needs, oftentimes you find out they're the same or very similar and you can come up with a very creative solution. So is, and I know that in this uh, training, you, you guys cover um, the idea of active listening is, what is that for our, for our listeners, maybe help them understand what active listening sure, and how that plays sure. into this philosophy. Sure. It's, it's one of the big skills um, of, of PT, that's for sure. And active listening really is, 
tuning into your, your children or adults for that matter, and really reflecting back uh, the most important part of what they're saying. I mean, a very, very simplistic example is for those that had toddlers, uh, your, your little one comes in and they bruise their elbow or their knee and they come in crying and it hurts, it hurts. And typically, and this was me before PET, it would say something like, wow, well, you know, wh what happened? Uh, where does it hurt? We'll make it better. We'll kiss it. It'll be okay. And the child will cry louder and louder. So instead of that, active listening on a very simple level would be to say, wow, that really hurts. And what happens often is they go, yeah, that's right. And they zip out their door to play again and it's, it's over. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, that's a simple example. A more detailed example, a child comes home and they're upset because they got a bad grade. And the parents say, wow, you're really disappointed. You expected that A instead of the B. And you continue on that vein, sharing back uh, what, what the child is saying, what's important to them, their feelings, as well as the facts. So active listening is really reflecting back, tuning in, listening on, on that level. Instead of just saying, I understand, uh, you show that you understand. Right. So how do you do that for, because uh, it sounds like that works with the compliant child, but more the belligerent child who, you know, is kind of the strong willed. I don't want to, you know, put a, put a, the child in the box, but th that type of, how does that work with active listening? Well, part of, part of the issue is whose problem is it? One, one of the, I think, geniuses of Tom in putting this all together, because all of the material wasn't his uniquely. To, I mean, active listening comes from sure. Rogeria and reflective listening and things. Tom worked with Carl Rogers. Um, is who owns the problem? So the first thing you have to do, and we have a, a really good model to kind of analyze and decide quickly, is it the parent's problem? Is it the child's problem? If you're talking about a child who's belligerent, who's doing who's, who's some behavior is unacceptable to the parent, we wouldn't active listen. Mm. We'd help the parent to send a message to let the child know what's not okay with their behavior. So the first thing you have to do is decide whose problem is it. Once you do that, if active listening is appropriate, then you can tune, you can tune into the anger. You're really angry. You don't like it when I, when I tell you what to do. You feel it's not fair when I tell you to go to bed at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, if, the, if it's the child's problem. If it's the parent's problem, active listening is not the skill to use. We have a thing called iMessages, not the EYE message. Uh, but a uh, capital I message, which okay. lets the child know very clearly that behavior is not okay. So let's talk about I. I'm just really uh, uh, piques my interest. The I message. What is what does that look like? Give well, us some examples, with, like you did for the sure, other sure. one. Exactly. I mean, oftentimes with kids, when they've got some music turned up loud, we say turn the darn thing down, uh -huh. uh, and we give them an order or command immediately. With adults, we don't often do that. We'll say, hey, I can't, I can't uh, relax when the music's up loud. So an I message, instead of saying you do this, you do that. Uh, giving an immediate solution. The I message is, is coming from yourself saying, hey, I'm, I'm really getting frustrated because I can't relax uh, because with the music up so loud. Um, so instead of saying, don't do this, do this, it's saying, I feel uh, my, my needs are this, um, I can't do that. And it gives the child then a chance to respond and say, oh, I, sh I should turn the music down instead of resisting being told what to do. So what happens if the child decides, well, tough luck. I, I want my music up louder. Sure, you can get that. Uh, and and, and uh, you send your iMessage, child says, who, even sometimes who cares or what, uh, so what, big deal. Um, then you have to tune into the child because um, it means something's going on. They feel resentful like they're always being told what to do or they're having fun. So this is where we put the two skills together. You, you hmm. send your iMessage. But if the child gets what we call emotionally flooded, I mean, you can think about that. If you begin to get angry, for instance, we've all had this experience, right. you get tight in the chest first, and then your throat, and then it's hard to talk, and then you can't hear, and pretty soon you, can, you have about a, a penny's worth of space to, to take in and think. So if a child is really upset and really frustrated, and you keep sending even an eye message, they're not going to hear it because they're too flooded. You have to say, wow, you really resent it when I tell you what to do, and that helps them unflood. So we put the two skills together. We call it gear shifting. Hmm. Uh, like in a car, you send your eye message. If, if, if they get resistive, you have to listen and, and, and uh, help unflood them. So the two skills go together. Uh, it's not always easy, but uh, you need to realize if the child can't hear you, there's no sense in keeping talking, which most of us do. We keep talking, talking, talking instead of stopping and listening to the child. This is fascinating because, I, I mean, I, the idea that this is not a power struggle is one that I think many, many parents wrestle with you know it's i'm the adult you're the child you listen to me you know and sure, and yet sure. the the win-win is that at the end of the day no one's happy right whether that be the sure, child or yeah. the parent exactly uh, 
So you, you, you also, you talk about this no lose conflict resolution method. How does that play out in terms of your training and especially in, in light of that type of power struggle? Well, I mean, again, as you said, we're used to power struggles and, and that's kind of the model that we've had in society, in, in, in homes and schools and, and work and business and in the military. I know many of your, your listeners are military families. Mm-hmm. I'll come back to that in a minute because yeah. I've done a lot of work with military yeah, families. Yeah, good. Um, and so the, the, the model we have is, is power and we think about we're in a power struggle. And again, usually it's fighting over solutions. And if we can really tune into to our children's needs Find that they want to have fun, they want to be respected, we can express our needs, we want respect, we want to be able to relax, then it gives us a chance to explore more, more, more options. But very much, I mean, the military, if we, if we go there for a minute, is I've done a lot of work with military families, and I've trained thousands of chaplains and social workers and people in the Dodd school systems uh, to become instructors in, in PET and teacher effectiveness training, for instance. Mm-hmm. And um, they face that. I mean, if, if, a, if a dad or, or a mom is in charge of a bunch of soldiers and uh, is used to telling him what to do and comes home and tries that with their teenagers, uh, all your families know that that doesn't work so well. They start getting resistance and they say, you can't tell me what to do. I'm, you're not my sergeant or my right. captain or whatever. Right. So it very much has been interesting that the military has very much embraced, for instance, PET hmm. as a way to help their, their, and, uh, their families uh, work together. And with military families, you have the added issue of moving so much and yes. being transient. So right. you have to be able to have good communication. You have to solve problems, meet new people. So not only for the parents, but it helps the children be able to make friends, listen to people, uh, express their needs in a better way, solve problems with their new friends. So that's a double benefit. It's it's not just for the parents. It's, it's the right. kids' benefits as well. Right. So, so what is the no-lose conflict resolution method? What is that? No-lose like? method really starts with before you start talking about solutions, which we typically both do, do mm-hmm. this, no, I don't want to do that, we first back up and say, what are our needs? What are your needs? Um, the child might say, I want this new toy, which is a solution. Or the parent says, you need to go to bed at 10 o'clock, which is a solution. Instead of that, we find out what the needs are. The child's needs might be to, to, be, uh, to have fun or to feel like they're, they're, they're at the same level as their new friends. If their new friends have new bikes or video games, they want to be included and accepted. Mm-hmm. Those are their needs. Hmm. Parents' needs might be around being respected or it might have to do with saving money or whatever. When you get the needs out there, so the first step, it's a six-step process we actually teach. It, it sounds complicated, but it's not really. Mm-hmm. The first step is what are your needs? What are my needs? What are your needs? Without talking about solutions. Then you brainstorm possible solutions, different options, lots of them. Mm-hmm. And from that, you pick the best ones that work for you and the child. And then you put it into practice. And you take action. Who's going to do what, when, where, by, by then? I can give you a quick example. Yeah, I, had a I love that. Yeah, mother that came to PT, and, and she said, the, the big problem right now with my daughter is that she doesn't want to clean up clean her room. And so we have this big conflict. And initially, she, she thought it was a values conflict, which we also look at in PT. We talk about values differences. So she tuned in and started to tune into her daughter. But the first thing she did was to say, I have this new way to make you change, clean up your room. And that didn't wash with the daughter. So she came back the next session to the course and talked about it. And she started to get the needs. And daughter's needs was to, to be able to feel she could make some of her own decisions, have independence. She wanted to feel respected by her mom. She wanted to be able to do her other things and have fun and whatnot, have ease of, of uh, enjoying and relaxing in her own room. Mom's needs was to feel comfortable in the house. If, if friends and family came, the, the rooms were visible from the, the living room and things, was to feel comfortable, relaxed. We don't be able to do the, her chores like the laundry easily. When they got the needs out, then the solution they came up with was the mother, in fact, cleaned the daughter's room once a week. And they got a wastebasket with a basketball hoop around the top of it so the daughter could pretend throwing her dirty clothes into the, into the laundry basket. Uh, playing basketball, so most of it made it into the laundry basket. They got a quilt, a big comforter, and the daughter could just throw that over the bed instead of having to make tight sheets like in the military. <laughs> and uh, that made it, that was looked fine from the outside for mom. And the daughter cooked meals for the, do- for the family three times a week. And the mom said, actually, I got a much better deal. Cooking and cleaning up three meals was much more work than, than zipping in there with the vacuum once a week and doing the laundry. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get stuck on, you clean up your room. It was my needs for fairness. That was one of mom's needs. Fair responsibility, the daughter for her needs. And they came up with a solution to work for both of them. Okay. 
Okay. Well, I want to take this outside the realm because I think oftentimes when it comes to parenting, we, we tend to lock in on more traditional problems. Sure. I want to, I want to take this outside of the traditional um, parent-child struggle and use an example of uh, what, what would you say to the, the parent who, the child, and I'm probably talking more of a teenager, uh, who is involved in a relationship or a part of a group of people that they are really concerned about the influences, the negative influences um, that that teenager is being exposed to, whether it be in that dating relationship or that um, you know group of the nucleus of friends. Sure, sure. You know, how would a parent respond to that? Because in some way, a parent would say, hey, this is at, there's a risk here. I need to step in and be that authoritative. You are no longer going to do this or sure. you're going to break up with so-and-so. Sure. How would pet deal with that situation well i mean we all know that's one alternative is to say you, you can't do that anymore and of course we all know from experience even sometimes from ourselves when we were young that you say don't do it and then we're apt to do it right uh you know you, <laughs> you say don't and they they don't hear the don't part they just do it so pet number one it, i think it talks about establishing a good relationship early on with your children um mm. that to me is important with for instance my own children and my own grandchildren now is if you can have a good relationship where you talk about things and you can exchange things back and forth by the time they become teenagers, it isn't suddenly something has changed overnight. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have a good relationship, if you can listen, if you can talk, then certainly a parent is going to go and, and share their I messages, their concerns, for instance, with their child. But they also need to back off and listen, not just say, you're not going to do it anymore, you can't do that, because that's just pushing. You know, what you resist persists. And if I say, don't mm -hmm. think about elephants, mm -hmm. you're going to keep thinking about elephants. If I right. say, don't see that boy again, you're going to keep seeing the boy again. So you need to, to let the child know that you're upset, you're concerned. It may, it may touch on values about their lifestyle or something. And then you need to stop talking and listen. Um, and one of the biggest things parents ask me is one of the most important things I could do. And I say, as a parent, talk less and listen more. Mm. Uh, and when you tune into the kids, if you don't push them, they're not, there's nothing to push back. And then we're up to come down and listen to you. If you if you want to get heard and listened to, first hear and listen. And then they're more apt to listen to you. So it's about listening a lot. It's about not pushing. Don't expect instant results. Now, obviously, if, if it's an extreme situation, I mean, if, if, it, if it's a life and death situation with drugs or lifestyle, you may have to step in and take some radical action. I mean, that that's a, uh, a possibility if, it, if it's that extreme. Mm -hmm. But what about, I mean, I'm just thinking that situation where the, the, the child, some, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it's kids that are just evolving, but it seems like today kids are really, really smart about this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. it's almost like they pacify their, their, their parents in, Oh, sure. I'll go through this, this rigor more of, you know, listening and be, being compliant to their face. But in reality, there's this, what's happening underground is a whole lot different oh, story. Sure, sure, so sure. how do you address that? I mean, at some point it's almost like the parent goes, you know what? Enough's enough. Um, would that be, in alignment with pet or would they, would they still just stay in that more listening mode? Well, it, it does. No. I mean, again, that's when it, the parent owns part of the problem and that's when it's, you stop listening and you start talking, you send your, your iMessage. When I first got trained in PET, I thought this iMessage stuff meant you had to be calm, cool and collected all the time. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can okay. yell an iMessage. You, okay. you, it's important to be as strong. You can be really, really, really strong with it. You can be militantly method three. You can say, look, I have had it. This behavior is not acceptable. I'm not going to put up with it, and I'm not also not going to force you to do something, but we have to work this out. Mm -hmm. So you can yell an iMessage. You can say, I'm really, really angry. I'm upset, whatever. It's important to be congruent and, and be clear about that. And then you need to back off and listen. But it isn't all just about the child's needs. You absolutely have to express your own needs. So PET can be very, very strong um, and very, very clear about these kind of things. And it, it may take time. I mean, we had our daughter had a boyfriend when she was in high school. She's in her 30s now. And we didn't like him much. And we let her know that, but we didn't push. We listened to her as she kind of experimented. Well, she had a pet rat. And the pet rat had never bitten anybody, was friendly. It bit the boyfriend on the ear and hung on his ear. <laughs> and that supported our message, and she got rid of the boyfriend. So uh, we had to wait a while for the rat's help, but it, it worked ultimately. So. But we had a good enough relationship, so she didn't turn us off. She, she listened. She said, eh, I want to give him another. I keep giving him a try for a while. Yeah. But the rat was the final straw. So. Well, you know, I think the the genius of this is you talk about the early relationship and having that that solid relationship from a, a young age and I think the method of what you're promoting 
allows you to establish that at a young age. If you're listening and you're empathizing and you know, those kind of things are so key to, to the heart of your child versus being the dictator and you know, yada, yada, yada. And, well, and you can start early. I mean, people say PT, you couldn't use it with babies or toddlers, and you can. There's ways you can listen to the nonverbals. There's way, we did problem solving with our daughter about medicine when she was 18 months old. I wow. won't have to go into the story now, but it's yeah. in the book, actually. Yeah. Um, but you can do it early. It's just different. You have to do a lot more tuning into the nonverbals. You have to use nonverbals. So it isn't just something for older kids either. So I, I, I've got to ask this question because I think on the radar of, radar of parents today, this is really, really high. Um, what, do you, what would you say to parents who the issue is technology and their kids constantly wanting to be on video games? Yeah. And, and that's universal. Everywhere I go, China, R- Romania, Bulgaria, and England, anywhere, it's, it's one of the things that pops up every single time. Hmm. It's, it's how do I get my child to stop looking at so many video games? Yeah. And the typical thing is parents say, well, I'm going to restrict it to one hour, two hours, whatever kind of thing. Sure. We've been lucky. I've, with I've our, done that. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. It's, it's a natural thing. We just say we can't, the, the dangers are too big. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we're, we're lucky with our grandkids. We have three grandkids and um, they're, they're six, uh, 11 and 12. And the problem with them isn't video games at night. It's put the books away and stop reading and go to bed. Uh, that's a wonderful problem. To yeah. have, but we still have a problem at some time they have to go to sleep. So, um, again, I think it's, it's tuning in. One of my best stories about the video games actually was, was a colleague in, in England. And she took PET years ago. And, and her son didn't like school much, wasn't very good, didn't, particularly didn't like math, and he didn't like history. And he liked video games. So he was playing quite a bit of video games. And all the, her friends said, you need to restrict him. You can't do this. You need to give him one hour. You need to put your foot down. And she said, no, I'm, I'm going to follow the PET man. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to get engaged. I'm going to listen to what he's doing, why he wants to do it. So she got herself much more involved knowing what was going on and keeping the conversation. And she said what happened was when I was there, as I saw her a couple of years ago, he had just graduated from uh, finished graduate school with a degree in international finance. Hmm. And she said what happened was he started to play games like uh, uh, civilization and, and things like that. And he suddenly started going on the Internet because he had to find out about history about how to build these empires. He had to find out about how to budget things to, to hire an army or to plant crops in his field. So because of the video games and because she kept the connection open, he, in fact, um, learned things that he wouldn't have. And here, he, a kid that hated school and hated um, history and finance ended up becoming a, getting a master's degree in international finance wow. and business. Wow. So uh, it's, again, it wasn't something she could snap her fingers and it happened overnight. She had to kept, keep the relationship. She, had to, she sat down next to him sometimes. She learned some of the games. She just kept, a, it wasn't like he was doing something in the basement. She had no idea. She kept engaged with him. She listened. She talked. At some time, she wasn't happy. She'd send her eye messages. They had to work problems through. It doesn't happen overnight. PET isn't magic. Mm-hmm. It's an ongoing uh, issue of uh, like a marriage. You, you can't mm-hmm. say we've reached it now. It's good. It's, it's an always ongoing process. You have to keep that communication. Yeah. Would, would you say that um, PET is for uh, the non-crisis type of parent-child relationship? I mean, I'm just thinking the ones that the, the out of control. Is it is, sure. is at that point it's too far gone and you need a different methodology? Well, you, you may, in extreme situations, you may, they may need therapy or intervention, but we've done a lot of PT uh, co- funded programs with, with organizations dealing with kids in crisis. Mm. I just was in California this spring uh, training some PT instructors that work at a, at a, a rehabilitation center for teens uh, where they have serious substance abuses. Mm-hmm. And so the staff there is trained in PT. They work with the parents. They work with the kids. There's actually a program called Youth Effectiveness Training as well where we work directly with the kids. So we've done a lot of programs, funded programs with kids in crisis through the courts. There's been some PET courses I taught. They were tough because the parent or parents, oftentimes one parent, were mandated to come. They had a choice, either lose your kids to the, to the system or take PET. Yeah. And of course, they come in with their arms folded. They don't want to talk to you. Right. But if you can right. break through that. Yeah. So yeah, we've done a lot of work with, with the situations of, of extreme crisis and, and pressure. Obviously, again, if, if there's a severe psychological problems, you're going to need some other resources yeah. as well. Well, 40 years doing this, I just, I, I want to wrap up with this question. What are the most common things that you've seen that parents struggle with that pet has become a real solution? Well, I, I think, I think, um, 
one of the big things is the is the teenage crisis years mm-hmm. is that parents you know that suddenly everything was fine and suddenly my child became a teenager and we have we're at war and we don't understand each other and one of the big things is the parents often say that didn't really happen because i i built a good relationship it wasn't that and, and normally why that happens is for for 12 or 13 years power works that the child does what the parent says and then suddenly they get physically and psychologically bigger and say not not anymore mm-hmm. I've, I've had it mm-hmm. so one of the big things is people people say wow we just don't have that big crisis anymore uh, another big thing is parents oftentimes i'll say to them um, you know what are some of the problems you've been facing you've had to do the method three the the no lose problem solving method and they say, well, there hasn't been that many because we head them off at the pass. We, we get them when they're small. We, we communicate. We solve our little problems. Um, a, a colleague of mine who I trained 30 years, 30 years ago, and her daughter now is in her Thursday, we were in China together, and we did an interview, and they asked this girl, I said, you know, how can you compare PET against the authoritarian method? And she says, well, I really don't know how to do that because... My mom has only used this other method. We haven't had these big fights. We haven't had these big crises. So I think that's one of the wow. big things that avoids big crises and yeah. big problems. Yeah, wow, it's that's much cool. easier. There are conflicts around values when kids get bigger, for instance, but they're not. They can be listened to, resolved, work through. There's more patience. There's more understanding. Right. Right. Good. Well, um, all of this is going to be linked below for the parenting or Gordon Training International is your website and they can go and this is not just about a book. I mean, there's training programs sure. and you, you offer these all over the country. So sure. there, come there, and there plug are in. instructors, instructors yeah. all over the, the, the country. And if they get in touch with Gordon Training International at the website, they can uh, find out where courses are. We also in, on the West Coast where you guys are in, in San Diego in October, I'm going to 